I've been asked to comment on the claim that an unreacted thermite material was found in the debris of the World Trade Center buildings. In particular, I've been asked to address this paper, which was published in the Open Chemical Physics Journal. The paper concludes with this statement. Based on these observations, we conclude that the red layer of the red-gray chips we discovered in the World Trade Center dust is active, unreacted, thermitic material, incorporating nanotechnology, and is a highly energetic pyrotechnic or explosive material. In order to understand the significance of what this paper is saying, I'll give a brief summary of thermite and thermate. Thermite is a mixture of powdered aluminium and some form of metal oxide, usually iron oxide, although it can be made with other metallic oxides, including, for example, copper. When these two materials react, the result is a formation of iron and aluminium oxide and a great deal of heat. In short, it is a highly exothermic reaction. Also, because the oxygen necessary for the process comes from the metal oxide, thermite compounds do not require atmospheric oxygen, and so are ideal for use in, amongst other things, underwater incendiary devices. However, thermite can be somewhat troublesome to ignite, and the subsequent reaction is violent and unpredictable. These factors, as well as the difficulty of applying it to the surface of a structure in a satisfactory manner, mean that it is not suitable for controlled demolition. As far as I'm aware, thermite has never been used in a controlled demolition, ever. Thermate is a variety of thermite, with the addition of small quantities of other substances, such as sulphur. These additional elements have the effect of increasing the heat output and also lowering the ignition point. Nanothermate is the same as thermate, but the particles are smaller. It has been suggested that this form of thermate can be contained in a gel and be formed or shaped in such a way that it could be used in a controlled demolition. That said, I am not aware of any thematic material ever having been used in a controlled demolition. Back to the paper. Before going into detail of the paper, it's necessary to look at the authors and where the paper was published. In relation to the authors, you can easily do the research yourself. I'll mention just a few. Stephen Jones is a well-known 9-11 conspiracy theorist who has been publishing papers on the subject for five years or more. He also gives many lectures on the subject. Niels H. Harrit has a similar pedigree. Greg Roberts gave his address as Architects and Engineers for 9-11 Truth, a collection of a thousand or so people from across the world who have joined together to encourage further investigations into 9-11 due to their belief that the original investigations were, in effect, a cover-up. One gives their address as International Centre for 9-11 Studies. The website for that organisation is somewhat lacking in detail, so I used the contact us function, and I did get a response. I'll come back to that later. Bearing in mind that the conclusion that they reach in this paper basically uncovers one of the greatest conspiracies the world has ever known, where do they go in order to publicise their findings? The Open Chemical Physics Journal. This, it has to be said, is an interesting choice. And by interesting, I mean not only are the contents of the paper not appropriate for a journal purporting to cover that topic, but I also mean it in a totally and deliberately sarcastic way. The journal is nothing short of a joke. Despite having an editorial board of 90 or so people from throughout the world, in 2009, the journal published four papers. To give you some idea of how staggering this is, YouTube user Thunderfoot has published, on average, four papers a year. But perhaps what is more interesting is the account given by Philip Davies, a graduate student of Cornell University. This article appeared in The New Scientist in September of last year. I'll pick it up at the beginning of the second paragraph. Earlier this year, Davies started receiving unsolicited emails from Bentham Science Publishers which publishes more than 200 open access journals, which turn the conventional business model of academic publishing on its head by charging publication fees to the authors of research papers and then making the content available for free. As the emails stacked up, Davis was not only encouraged to submit papers, but was also invited to serve on the editorial board of some of Betham's journals, for which he was told he'd be allowed to publish one free article each year. I received solicitations for journals for which I had no subject expertise at all, says Davis. It really painted a picture of vanity publishing. 
Sir Davis teamed up with Kent Anderson, a member of the publishing team at the New England Journal of Medicine, to put Bentham's editorial standards to the test. The pair turned to SCI Gen, a program that generates nonsensical computer science papers, and submitted the resulting paper to the Open Information Science Journal, published by Bentham. The paper, entitled Deconstructing Access Points, made no sense whatsoever, as this sample reveals. In this section, we discuss existing research into black-red trees, vacuum tubes, and courseware. On a similar note, recent work by Takahashi suggests a methodology for providing robust modulates, but does not offer an implementation. Davis and Anderson, writing under the nom de plume David Phillips and Andrew Kent, also dropped a hefty hint of the hoax by giving their institutional affiliation as a Centre for Research in Applied Phonology, or CRAP. Yet four months after the article was submitted, David Phillips received an email from Sana Mokaram, Betham's assistant manager of publishing. This is to inform you that your submitted article has been accepted for publication after peer reviewing process, the name of the publication. I would be highly grateful to you if you could please fill and sign the attached fee form and covering letter and send them back to me via email as soon as possible to avoid further delay in the publication. The publication fee was $800 to be sent to a PO box in the United Arab Emirates. Having made his point, Davis withdrew the paper. I failed to mention earlier that Kevin Ryan and Frank Legg are joint editors, along with Stephen Jones, of the Journal for 9-11 Studies. So, so far, we have a collection of authors who appear to have a bias. Allegations of bias are something that Stephen Jones is familiar with. In his paper, Why Indeed Did the WTC Buildings Collapse?, he used this photograph, with the annotation, Workers evidently peering into hot core under the WTC rubble. This photograph was doctored. This is the original. And the glow that you actually see is from a portable light used by the workmen as they search through the rubble. Jones has also faced criticism for his analysis of Mayan archaeological evidence as supporting his belief that Jesus had in fact visited America. In any event, the authors then published the paper in an obscure journal with a dubious reputation for peer review. But it gets even better than that. The paper was published without the editor's knowledge. I've not been able to find out exactly how this happened, but it is clear that as a result of this paper's publication, the editor, Marie Paul Pellini, resigned. A fuller record of the statements that she has made in relation to this matter are linked in the description. I'll just rely on these. They have printed the article without my permission, so when you wrote to me I did not know that the article had appeared. I cannot accept this, and therefore I have written to Bentham that I have resigned from all activities with them. She continued, I cannot accept that this topic is published in my journal. The article has nothing to do with physical chemistry or chemical physics and I could well believe that there is a political viewpoint behind its publication. If anyone had asked me, I would say that the article should never have been published in this journal, period. As I indicated earlier, I contacted the International Centre for 9-11 Studies, and I received a response. My initial question related to this ambiguous statement on the website. Specifically, I asked who the director and members of staff were. I received a response from James Gawley, one of the authors of the paper, indicating that he was director. He then asked how he could help. I replied by asking about the paper, and again he responded and asked if I had any specific questions. I sent him a list of seven. For the purposes of this video, only a few are important. I asked him whether the paper had been peer-reviewed. His response was, it was peer-reviewed by, if I remember correctly, two reviewers chosen by the journal editors. I don't recall if I ever found out who did the review, or who it was if I did. I asked about the editor's resignation. His response was, I didn't follow the resignation episode very well. I think I recall something about her saying something like, she didn't feel qualified to give her opinion on the paper's technical merits, which was a nonsense. But what is of more importance is this. I don't know whether the people who rely upon this paper, as evidence of the use of thermite or thermate, actually know what the paper says. Here is a response I received from James Gawley when I touched upon the subject. Firstly, we don't know whether nanothermite was used to bring the towers down. It might have played some other role, such as keeping the fires going long enough to make the fire-induced collapse theory plausible. 
It might have been used in conjunction with other high explosive materials to bring the building down. Nanothermite matches are known to exist, and I believe that they can be used to detonate high explosives. We really just have no idea how it was used. The salient point is, it shouldn't have been in the WTC dust at all. And here is Niels Harrett, another of the co-authors, talking about the same issue. So what effect would the nanothermite have had on the collapse of the towers on September the 11th? Uh, actually, within the group of authors behind this paper, which we published in April, there are diverging opinions about what this nanothermite was used for. And in my opinion, we should not speculate in a, in a scenario for the demolition. For these reasons, and the reasons I've outlined in the video, I do not intend to deal with the contents of this paper unless there is a specific question about it that demands a response.